So why language? Why are we taking the time to study language in APHG? Well, it's part of culture, right? Last week, we talked about what culture is. We looked at material versus non-material culture. In other words, you're visible versus you're invisible. And language is very much a part of our, um, it can be, it can be, a, you know, written things to be written down, but language itself is invisible in terms of our culture. It's, it's non-material. It's something that is, is, um, a lot of times we think about our identity. We think about it goes hand in hand with the language that we speak, this, which does not have to be a written language. Many of your, of your, um, indigenous languages today, Africa has more linguistic diversity than any other place in the world. Many of the languages there are spoken by small indigenous groups that don't have a written language. So the reason we are studying language is to understand the spatial perspective or the why of where. Language is a part of who we are. It's a huge part of our identity. I just mentioned that. Many cultures measure their culture by their language, okay? So you might think that religion is another, is another big part of this, okay? Um, um, uh, but language is, is as big, if not bigger in some cases, than even religion in terms of how people uh, measure who they are based on their identity. A perfect example is I always show my students a video of, um, of a Native American speaker. She is the last fluent Native American speaker of this particular language that she's speaking. And she says that sometimes she will still dream in the language that she, that she grew up with. But she has to speak English in order for anyone to be able to understand her. Now, what must it be like to tell your stories, to tell your history, or to um, talk with people in your village that are supposed to be the, those who carry out the legacy of your people in somebody else's words? And that's the key here. It's hard for us a lot of times in the United States to really understand truly um, that that when someone else is speaking uh, a language as a second language, especially of obligation, they're having to use other people's words in order to convey meanings that they might have inside of themselves. And, and often it, it doesn't translate just right. Um, for example, my stepsister is fluent in, in French. Okay. Uh, and she says that whenever she would go over to France and speak with people that are native there, uh, she sounds like she's talking to, in, in her mind. She says that she feels like people might think she's ignorant or might think that she's not super smart because she doesn't know exactly every word to be able to say exactly what it is she means to say in English. It's the same kind of thing. Um, another really important thing that we're going to look at with language in particular is that it is under attack by the forces of globalization. And when I say globalization, remember last week we talked about this and I mentioned that there is economic, cultural, and a third, political globalization. The main thing we're looking at here is cultural and economic globalization is what is really attacking language on a local level. Um, here's a picture of Maasai herdsmen. These, this is an indigenous group that kind of lives over here in um, eastern Africa and Kenya. Um, they are herders. All right? And you can see they have very you know, a uh, unique look, very, um, you know, they are one of a kind. They are very much an independent uh, identity, a, a culture in and of themselves. There is another picture that I, I could not find it for the life of me, but I've shown it every single year that I've been teaching this class. And it is a picture of one of these individuals on a cell phone. So he's sitting out there, maybe with a, one of these stabs or whatever in his hand and this tribal gear, and he's on the phone. What language do you think he's speaking on the phone? Um, what do you think he's trying to do? Uh, is he speaking in his native tongue? Is he talking to his neighbor down the street? Probably not. It's probably some kind of an economic basis. Maybe he's trying to make a transaction. Maybe he's trying to do business with someone. But he's on the phone, and he is talking probably not in his native language. So when you think about individuals that maybe have a language with no written tradition, okay, or they have a language that maybe a few people in one part of a country speak, but they want to do business on a grander scale. They want to have opportunities, education. They want to have um, their economic opportunity. They want to have a better life for their kids. Well, what language are they going to speak in order to do that? They're going to end up going home, 
and figuring out different ways that they can learn English or French, or maybe in this case, Swahili or some kind of a, of a, of a larger, more widely spoken language that might be to them a language of opportunity. And in doing so, maybe they don't teach their kids to speak their native language. They might teach their kids to speak English or French or Swahili. So this is what I mean whenever I mentioned up here that languages on a local level are under attack by the forces of globalization. Well, languages go extinct on a regular basis. Right now, numbers project that somewhere around 6,700 different languages might exist today. Um. I, I don't know exactly what the number is. Like more than half of those languages are pr pr projected to die out in the next, you know, several decades. I mean, it's unbelievable how much um, globalization, how much these things are are attacking. I guess the way we live and uh, the way that people interact together on a, on a global level, culturally and economically, it really does put a damper on local languages. Understanding cultural diffusion and cultural landscape is intertwined with understanding the distribution of language across space. What I mean by this is you can't go anywhere without seeing language as part of the local geography, as part of the cultural landscape. When we talk about toponyms, what do we mean by that? Toponym, simply a place name. All right? You can have places like I, I was just now in Metter, Georgia over the weekend, seeing my uh, relatives. We had a family reunion. All right. and interestingly, you can see that the border of Metter is, is a circle, except for this little section here on the other side of the interstate. Uh, I'm sorry, on the other, other side of this highway. Uh, so obviously they have just a radius for their boundary. Very, very small town, but over here, hope you like it. I guess that's how you say it. Um, interesting place. I was wondering how in the world did this place get its name? Toponyms, place names. Um, sometimes you'll see places named after politicians like Washington or um, places or streets or intersections or exchanges named after Martin Luther King, in, in particular in the South. Um, entertainment or education, you might see uh, uh, elements of, of um, entertainment. You might see elements of um, language in entertainment and education as well. Um <laughs> How do languages start? What's the origins of language? Well, you've got the Tower of Babel. Any churchgoers out there know about the story of the Tower of Babel? Apparently, according to the Bible, what you've got people doing is they were building this massive tower in order to reach straight up to heaven and, I guess, be on equal footing with God. So, according to the story, God destroyed the tower and scrambled up all the words of mankind and individuals no longer spoke the same language because with the same language, they had enough power to rival God. And therefore, if they can't speak the same language, they can't work together in order to build such a magnificent structure or whatever it might be. And so individuals start to spread out and migrate on the basis of whatever they spoke. And that's according to, the again, the Bible, uh, why people speak the way they do. But maybe it's not so cut and dry like that. Really, the truth is, no linguists know exactly what the origin of language is, or if there ever was a single original language. Personally, I don't know how language wouldn't have been repeatedly reinvented by individuals again and again and again. And I'll tell you why I feel like this. Um, uh, as a twin, my twin and I grew up speaking just a, a weird language that only we could understand what we meant. And, and we, we couldn't half talk until we were almost four or five years old, but we sure as heck could understand each other. I just can't help but to think that even prehistoric human beings, hunter and gatherer folk, would have had to have had some form of communication that may not be the same as individuals, you know, that might be spread far and wide from where they are, but nevertheless, it seems to me like it would make sense that people would continually reinvent language. Nevertheless, linguists do tend to trace languages back to proto-languages using a process. I should have bolded this word. If I were you, I wouldn't know it. They are backwards reconstruction. Okay. And, and so essentially what they would do is they would determine the relationship between languages based on comparing words that 
these languages would share, such as father, mother, brother, and other pronouns. Now, why would they use those? Well, everyone is going to have a word for these things, right? And so if you can look back and find relationships between words that uh, for father and mother that sound like an older version of father and mother and be able to relate that to other languages that may have stemmed from that proto or original language, then you're able to figure out the relationship between languages on the basis of these common words. Another way of doing it is not just words like father and mother and brother or pronouns, but you also might have um, words for things like the ocean or words for things like different farm animals or different kinds of tools that they will have used for agriculture. Well, would someone that didn't live near the ocean have an original word for ocean? No. But someone that lived in like a, a, a steppe region might have a word for certain animals like horses. And so you can find where that word might have diffused and traced the migration pattern, more or less, of individuals that have carried that language with them. And the language has diverged, or that is, has changed over time with migration. Another way that uh, linguists study these original languages and the and, uh, I guess the languages that shoot off of these original languages is through the study of the family tree. Just like you might have a family tree with your matriarch or patriarch as the oldest member of your family. Um, Languages are going to go back to, and this is kind of hard to see. It's very small, but this is probably in your textbook. If you use Rubenstein, this is in your textbook. You've got this, these uh, 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 proto languages that would have been your individual language families. If you look here, for example, at the Indo-European language family, The Proto-Indo-European would have been like an original language that would have been spoken by individuals that eventually, due to migration and and just space in between, the languages began to change over time, and it would become many of the languages that we speak today. And so language trees are used to show linguistic relationships. Here's a bigger version of that language tree. Um, Notice that this number here is 27 2,722. Well, what this is trying to show you is the number of native speakers of these languages. And that would be ludicrous to think that the Indo-European language is so big with only 2,722 speakers. This is in billions. I'm sorry, this is in millions. So what we're looking at here is there are today 2.7 billion speakers of an Indo-European language of some sort. Uh, You look a little closer up here, I've got another graphic that shows uh, this is just a fraction of some of the languages that might spin off of these language families, okay? But um, really all of this is Indo-European. This isn't looking at any other language family, just the Indo-European language family. Um, And you've got these different branches, okay? So these are here would be the branches of the tree. These different branches represent other languages that further... um, uh, 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 further broke apart, further diverged as time went on. So you've got the Balto Slavic, the, uh, you've got the, the Germanic, the Roman, the Celtic, uh, the Indo Iranian. Uh, these are all different languages that, are, that exist today that are part of the Proto Indo European language family. 